Okay, I fixed it. All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Welcome to <laughs> your gear QA. We had some technical difficulties. Uh, <laughs> got to get back. Got to get got to used to working with the OBS software again. I was using StreamYard for a little while, and um, I didn't like it. A lot of you guys were complaining about stuff, and uh, I, I think a lot of the problems that happened with it was was the uh, StreamYard stuff. So it seems much better now that I switched back to OBS. So real, oh, let me mute that. So anyways, uh, real quick, uh, if you're new to the live show, all you have to know is if you want to check out any things we talk about, there's an index down below on the replay, and I highlight everything we talked about. If you want to ask a question while it's live, start with a question mark first. And if you want to check it out as a podcast, it's on iTunes and, and Spotify and things like that. And... Uh, a lot of people consume it that way as well. Um, so there you go. Hope everybody had a great week. Uh, my week is hot. It's a very hot, hot time where I live. I live in Arizona and it's, uh, I don't know, a thousand degrees, whatever it is. <laughs> it's hot. Okay, so let's get into some questions. Let's get right into it since we start with some technical difficulties. Um, the first question, I always try to hit the very first question that, that came up on the stream. And that comes from Tustet. Tustet said, hey, Phil, love the channel. Do you still have your Hughes and Kettner, or Kettner, Hughes and Kettner Aura 2 amp? And that's my acoustic amplifier. Uh, Hughes and Kettner makes two Aura 1 uh, amps, the Aura 1 and the 2. I have the 2, which is the more expensive uh, larger version of the two. Uh, and he wants to know, do I still have it? Yes, I do still have it. And two, is it worth the money compared to competitors on the market? Uh, review anytime soon. Um, I like it. Obviously, I gig with it. If I take my acoustic, I take it. If I take my bass, that's what I've been taking as a bass amp for a lot of things. There's a bunch of videos I've done on the channel where I'm playing uh, bass through it. It's I've really tried to abuse the thing, and it's it's a pretty bulletproof. bulletproof. It's made in Germany um, and uh, in the actual Hughes and Kettner facility. So that's only interesting because I think the only things they're make making there are like three amps. I think they make two Aura amps and then the one of the more expensive tube amps for the guitar series. Um, and it's very good stuff. Now, here's the part I can't help you with. How is it compared to competitors? I've never a beat it to anything. I've played other stuff. I really like the Fishman Loud Box. I mean, that's a great amp. Um, I really like Fender's affordable series of acoustic amps they put out now. Those things are really good for the, the, the money they are. They are not very expensive and they are very good. Now, some people are going to be like, they love them. Some people are going to like, not so much. But I'm remember, keep in mind, I'm kind of giving it the, uh, uh, for the price, it's good. For the price, I had no complaints in those amps. But for the higher end amp series, there's a lot of choices out there. But obviously, I, I like the Hughes and Kettner era too. They send it to me and ask me to check it out and mess with it. And uh, I've been beating it up and abusing it for a year, and I'm still pleased with it. So, um, you know, I, I can't speak to the price because it is expensive. I think it's like $1,500. Um, it was one of the few things. There's probably, since I've probably done now, you know, obviously with, I think I have six, 700 videos out. Uh, I think uh, at this point I've tried, you know, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of products. And there are very few products when I get them, I just didn't have a reference of the price. And I remember playing it, loving it, and think it was great, and demoing it and checking it out and trying it and doing stuff. And then one day I, I just looked it up and I was like, wow, $1,500, I had no idea. I, I thought, you know, uh, in fact, that's how I knew, found out it was made in Germany. I thought $1,500, I thought it was, you know, more in their affordable series of stuff. And then I looked and know it's their premium stuff. So very cool. Um, Tim Bridge says, how do you hang your Parker? Uh, whoops, he wants to know, how do I hang my Parker on the wall? It moved. Okay, here it is. Uh, just got a Parker Deluxe and love it. It's a different animal. Okay, so Tim, the, uh, my Parker is not behind me, but yes, if you see my videos, my Parker is hanging. First of all, when Parkers were new and they came, uh, when they came to you new, they came with this little plastic piece that scared the living crap out of me. Because this little piece of clear plastic, you would stick it onto your tuning keys. Uh, it would hold like three tuning keys on the Parker, and then it would have have a little, uh, like a almost like a coat hanger. It was like a coat hanger for your Parker. Uh, some of you guys, if you Google it, you'll know what I'm talking about. This thing was just this little piece of plastic, and you stuck it on there. And I always thought that was the 
dumbest thing I ever saw because I was uh, I was sitting there, you know, these guitars were expensive, and I'm thinking, man, who wants to put a piece of plastic on their guitar and then hang it on the wall? It just seems scary. Uh, and I, and you know what? And when I look at Parker's shoes now, all of them have these big chunks taken out of them. I always wonder, like, did they fall off the wall? So the reason I tell you that, Tim, unfortunately uh, for you, that's what you would need, but I, would, I wouldn't do it. I would do a sideways hanger. Um, but the reason mine hangs vertically is because mine is a custom shop, Parker. I had that custom made. I was, I was one of the few Parker dealers on the West Coast. I, I started, when I opened my store in 2005, I opened as a Parker dealer, and I sold quite a bit of Parkers. <laughs> um, it was just a guitar that I liked. No one else seemed to like it, and no one seemed to carry them. And so I sold a lot of them. And at some point I started selling their custom guitars and we did some custom runs. And one of the things I asked for was a headstock you could hang uh, to hang in. So my headstock, my, my Parker Mojo is just, just like every other Mojo you've ever seen. Same specs, same features, same color. It's just, you know, mahogany. But my headstock is slightly wider to accommodate a, a, a thing. And, and I would have probably had them, I did a bunch like that, but I would have probably you know, had more done, but then they went out of business. Okay. There you go. Uh, be weir, be where, be weir, be weir says, be weir says, beware, 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 beware says, <laughs> I think I've become hyper paranoid on all these names. Cause I don't know when you're reading them, they're just all, all letters. All right. Anyways, it says, Hey, Phil, love the channel. I sent an email about Ibanez frets. I want to fix myself, uh, have a Stumac file. Uh, so he has a, a Stumac file, but doesn't want to damage the binding uh, and the metal edge. Wait, the metal on edge of the frets is over the binding. Please help. Uh, well, the binding is no different than wood, okay? Sure, if it's got uh, plastic binding, plastic is softer than wood, especially the binding, the material they're gonna use is a little softer, and could you score it? Sure, could you scratch it? Absolutely. Not much more dramatically than wood, so what I'm saying is, is you don't really have to treat it much differently than wood. Um, it's uh, the exception being, of course, like a Gibson Les Paul, right behind there, um, because of the fact that the way the binding comes up, you know, over the the edge of the fret, um, well, it doesn't come over the fret, but you know what I mean, comes up to the edge, the way it's cut in, it's got these little, I don't know, tips, <laughs> nibs, I don't know. Uh, but anyways, the point is, uh, there's nothing really you have to be aware with on that. You would still t uh, tape it off with painter's tape. You still do it the same way you would do anything else. And to be honest with you, uh, you would still polish the the uh, binding the same way you'd polish wood. So in other words, if you did get micro scratches on it, you would use, uh, I use micro mesh because I really like it. Especially now, if you go to my um, my last uh, Sharp Max video, which I think was yesterday, uh, and there's a link in there for micro mesh. I found micro mesh now on Amazon for a, a song for the 17 bucks. It's worth worth every penny, 17 bucks. I, I, I promise you guys, you buy that micro mesh uh, uh, on, on uh, Amazon for 17 bucks. If you're a hobbyist repair person, that's enough to last you for a year. So that's like a dollar something a month. Worth its weight in gold, it'll fix all kinds of problems like that. Um, so if you do uh, get some little file marks on there, just use those pot pads and polish it up. Just It's a step process. There's, I think, seven to nine sheets. You start with the 1500 and you'll end at 12,000. That's how you go. So that's what I would do. Hope that helps. Hope that helps. I know it's scary. Uh, I, I'll tell you, binding, the only time binding becomes a real issue, refrets. You tend to, I dread them. <laughs> and I don't know why. It was just something I, when I started doing repairs many, many moons ago, uh, it was like, gosh, 20 years now ago, um, that's what everybody told me was binding was horrible. And so it's just in my head now. But sometimes when I'm refretting bind bound guitars, I don't find it's a problem. I don't find it's even worse. But for some reason, I do dread it. Uh, Scott says, a lot of Les Pauls on the wall for someone who doesn't care for them. Who doesn't care for them? <laughs> um, I like guitars, man. This is a guitar channel. Um, I've had... I, I understand because you're talking about because last week we talked about the fact that I'm uh, I think if you're if you recall the the statement I said last week was I bought my first Les Paul well, I didn't buy my first Les Paul but I got a Les Paul because I was I was really enjoying my PRS and my P, my Les Paul my Gibson buds were like PRS sucks and so I got a Les Paul because I was kind of like hey now I have one what do they have so um, but then I like I said I kind of 
I've kind of learned to like them. Now, I will tell you, out of all my Les Pauls, the one I like the most is this one that I'm pointing at right now. If you guys are on the podcast, I'm pointing at my Les Paul Light, which is the thinner one. I love it because as you're looking on the wall, it looks just like the other two, but it's half, well, not half the weight. Let's just say two to three pounds lighter, thinner, feels like my SG that's right next to it, but looks like a Les Paul. And it sounds, I can't say it sounds the same as a regular Les Paul, but that's not because... I, I can't quantify to you, unfortunately, that it's because it's thinner. It sounds different. It just sounds different. I mean, all three of those Les Pauls behind me sound totally different. So, uh, and, and I know there's pickups in there, but I mean, I think the, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the gold top behind me and the light have the exact same pickups. So uh, I have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure that, that they have the both, the same pickups. But uh, anyways, uh, you know, but yeah, I like the way Les Pauls look. I just don't like 12 to 13 pound guitars. Um, oh, Miles, great question. Miles says, hey, does a Gibson Modern uh, weight relief, so he's talking about the, the, the weight relief that Gibson does, does that Les Paul have the same, some characteristics of a semi hollow body? No, I don't believe so. And, and you know, there's no answer that's ever gonna say 100% yes. So I say that just because it just keeps things easy. It's going to be so min minute that, that what it's done when they do chambered. Because think about this. It's the way they do re weight relief is different than, let's say, chambering out. A lot of times they're just drilling those holes. Like some of them have like the nine holes in the body. Some of them have the kidney being uh, cut out. And it. I found that when you talk about semi-hollow guitars, I found in my personal travels when playing guitars because i like semi-hollow guitars i if you notice i have a lot of them it's funny i have none displayed here but do i have a lot of them um and uh, and if you notice like when i've done my last few guitars that i've had them uh they're semi-hollows and uh no i don't notice that chambered guitars uh sound the same like that new carvin theos i got carvin kiesel kiesel <laughs> theos uh, i guess i'm dated i'm gonna it's like a it's like, remember when you used to call, I used to call uh, Costco Price Club. Just remember when people in Costco was Price Club and used to call things, oh, calling Nissan a Datsun. Do that one. That's fun too. Hey, it's like a Datsun. Anyways, Carvin Kiesel. Kiesel, uh, my Kiesel Theos is uh, is weight relieved and it's got a, I think it's got a kidney bean route in it and it has no, no characteristics that I can hear with my ear that remind me of semi hollows. And when I, when I say that, semi hollow guitars tend to always have this really pronounced mid range that I tend to dig. So if that helps, but again, guitars are so, they're so different, but there's just general characteristics that you can, you can, you can easily kind of lend those ideas to a lot of guitars and say, yes, this guitar is like that. But I, in that case, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, hold on. I had some cool questions and I penned a couple real fast and then it moved. Michael's got a question. Unfortunately, Michael, this is going to be a horrible answer for you. It says, what is the weirdest guitar or instrument that I own? A, a lap slide, a sitar, a lute, and how often do you play it? I don't think I own a single weird instrument. The only thing that I own that's not a guitar or a bass is, I mean, I have a piano in the house, but I don't play it. That's my daughter's. Um, I have a six-string ukulele, <laughs> and that's not even, not even weird because it's, you know, it's just a ukulele. It's a six string. And I do play that quite often. Um, but it's, that's it for weird. Uh, and sadly enough, I don't even own a lot of weird shaped guitars either. <laughs> so, um, over the years, I've probably dabbled here and there, you know what I mean? Some weird instruments, but immediately went back. It, it, to be honest, like I said, I think I've said this until I had the YouTube channel, I really wasn't even playing guitar all that much. I was playing my bass all the time. And I would work on guitars, of course, because uh, that's what pays my bills to this day. That's still how I make my most money is repair. And, um, and I would collect the guitars and I would play them, but I wouldn't really play them as much as I now. Now I play them a lot. I, I think I, I play a guitar. I, I definitely now play guitar way more than I play bass. Um, and I notice that because sometimes when I pull out the bass, I can tell my family, especially my wife, are like, oh, he's got the bass out. Like, and then, I, you know, you can tell mannerisms like, wow, I must not be pulling out the bass and playing it as often as I used to because I used to play it two, three times a day, and now I'm playing it every couple days. All right, Steve. Hold on, Steven. I need water. 
He says he wants to say he got a Valve Junior and asked about a few weeks ago. Oh, so he got it. Quite happy with it. I've done, I've done, I've done some preamp tube swap to get the fullest clean tone I can. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. In other words, like he's, it's, it's a good purchase. Not like goodbye. He's saying goodbye to me. Uh, <laughs> good purchase. Uh, yeah, that great. I'm glad it worked out for you. The Valve Junior, like I said, is a little cool. It's definitely a little interesting, cool amp. And I think it's one of those amps that you can keep for a long time because it's a, it does what it does very well. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Jay Bogix, Bog Bogix, Bogix. I don't even, man. I don't even get you know, I don't even know. Jay. Jay says, uh, this Vegas heat sucks. <laughs> How would you extend pickup wires that someone else cut too short rather than desoldering them off? Uh, oh, uh, and waffles. I don't know what the waffles part, but let's uh, let's talk about that. So extending uh, pickup wires. Well, it depends. Okay, so if you can, you want to you want to go back to the source as close as you can without having to rewind rewind an entire pickup. That's definitely a nightmare you don't want to do um, for the average person, especially if you don't have a winder. And um, but uh, I'm trying to think of the best way. I have. So I have a cheat, but I, it wouldn't work for you. So I'm going to tell you what I would do, and then I'm going to tell you what I think you should do. The first thing is I have almost every kind of wiring assembly collected up through the years. So what, what I mean by that is, you know, um, I have extenders it, is what I'm saying for almost every type of pickup. So if you brought me a Seymour Duncan pickup with like a, an inch and a half of wire, I have a Seymour Duncan extender. I have that wire, that whole entire tube with all the five wires in it. Uh, and I have it in a length and I can just go in there and solder it, shrink wrap everything together and pull it together and extend it out and make it look clean and nice. Um, so that's easy to do there. Uh, essentially, the, the, without that in play, the, the only thing you're really going to do is just literally take and extend it with wires. Um, I would use uh, uh, shrink tubing, you know, heat shrink, right? Um, and make it clean and nice. I'm trying to think if I've done a video where I've done any extensions on that. You know, to be honest with you, it used to be more common than than now. Um, it's funny how how just thinking about talk, as I'm talking, I'm thinking about the fact that I could honestly say, if I want to say, just ten years ago, I remember doing that s at least a couple times a week. Somebody comes in with pickups to install that they bought used off eBay, and you would have to constantly extend the wires out. But now everybody's so used to the idea that they yank out pickups and. So no one's really cutting the wire short anymore. Everybody just kind of wraps them. Even I zip tie and wrap as much wire as I, I can. I try not to cut the wire short anymore. Um, there's probably some arc arguments about capacitance that way. The longer the wires, the capacitance. But to me, the argument for me is, you know, I don't know. I can't really imagine if I cut a wire down to five inches or if I let, left eight inches of wire. You know what I mean? I, I don't, I don't want to sit there and be... I don't want to make myself so nuts that I'm thinking about what three inches of wire is changing the tone. I think that's just going to make me, that's just too crazy. And so convenience factor, I just leave wire wrapped. You'll notice a lot of companies do that now. I notice a lot of the pre-wired pick guard companies, they wrap them around the posts on the pick guard. Uh, so, which doesn't help you in your current situation. So in your current situation, I would just go ahead and just solder it to new wire and extend it with wire. Use like wire if you can and uh, just go from there. My guess, too, is the first time you do it, it's going to look really gnarly. <laughs> it's, if it, don't worry about it, man. Don't worry about it. If you do it, if it works. So here's what you do. You do it. If it works, then you go, like, great. If you look at it after it works and it looks like crap, redo it to make it look better. Or if you're fine with it, hey, it's going to go underneath the hood, so to speak. I don't, I, I've seen worse in guitars that have worked way fine. Like, so. All right. Uh, hold on a second, guys. I have to refresh this so I can see because I think I'm skipping something. Okay. Um, Dylan Talks Tone. Hey, from the channel. I wonder, is it the same Dylan Talks Tone from uh, the channel, Dylan Talks Tone? Anyways, uh, Dylan Talks Tone says, have you tried much carbon fiber? Uh, you mean carbon fiber guitars? I've owned many carbon fiber instruments with all non-pleasing results. So in my carbon fiber, so so I, I'm assuming we're talking about carbon fiber instruments. So it says, have you tried much carbon fiber? So carbon fiber, there's a couple things. We'll, so we'll cover both. 
because it'll be fun, right? First, there's carbon fiber stuff like carbon fiber rods that they put in guitars like Ivan is does and Kiesel does. Uh, so yes, I've seen, I've had many guitars that have carbon fiber rods in them. Uh, I prefer, and I don't know why, but I prefer the way Fender, I don't know if they still do it this way, but they used to in all the deluxes, they used to use carbon fiber rods, but what they did was they used wooden dowels and wrapped them in carbon fiber because Fender was the, kind of found that the carbon fiber rods were so stiff, the neck was not moving correctly. You know, I don't want to say correctly, just not moving in a natural way, right, when you felt it. And it, believe it or not, it sounds strange, but you could feel that. But if you're talking about carbon fiber instruments, oh yeah. So I've owned many modulus instruments, uh, Zons. I, I, used to, I used to play nothing but Zons for, I went years with just playing Zon basses, mostly in the bass realm. But for guitars, I've owned a modulus guitar. I've owned a Moses uh, Graphite, which isn't carbon fiber, but kind of like carbon fiber. Of course, the Parkers have carbon fiber in them. So uh, I've done, and my experience with carbon fiber is, it's one of those things where I think deep down, no one's had the time or money to get it right. And here's what I mean by that. It always plays great, but it doesn't feel right. <laughs> Somebody will say sounds right. I can't even get past the, I don't, can't even get to the sound issue, right? It's to me, it never feels right. It, it's, there's, you know, when you think of a piece of wood being so stiff, you know what I mean? It's really weird. It's kind of like, it's kind of like to me, this is gonna be the weirdest thing ever. It's kind of like basic training in the army and they're like, don't run on the concrete. OK, and I remember them yelling at you, don't run on the concrete. Now, some of you guys, older dudes that were in the Army or the Marines, uh, you're, you're going to be like, what? They told us, you know, they just made us run whatever. But what happened when I was in was they didn't want us running on in the boots on concrete because everybody was getting shin splits, shin splints. And so we would run on pavement, you know, like, you know, road and or on dirt, uh, but not on the concrete. And I remember thinking that was weird. You know what I mean? Like, uh, wh why not on the concrete? Like in my head, I was like, that's the same. And what happens is, is you, you realize, no, man, that, that, uh, by the way, uh, for those guys that are probably watching that were in the Navy, I heard running on ships uh, is even worse because uh, the, the, basically the ship's moving up and down and, and you get shin splints even worse. But that being said, <laughs> go back to my, my story. Uh, in the Army, shin splints, uh, so you don't want to get them so they didn't want you running on concrete in your boots. So my point to this story is, I thought, how silly is that, that concrete can give you a shin splint, but asphalt wouldn't. And it's almost like, do they even know what they're talking about? Here's what's funny about that. To this day, you could take the, one of the hardest pieces of wood and make a neck out of it. But when you make a carbon fiber neck and you give it to me, it's so rigid and hard that it feels it, it feels so different that I just don't like it. And I don't know if it's because it's unfamiliar because all the years playing the wood neck. I don't know if it's, you know, in, in my head. I don't know if it's real, but it's just something I can't get around to. Now, I wouldn't be so focused on that if it wasn't for the fact that no really, no, no say no really, Carbon fiber instruments, for some reason, never seem to take off. And there's a ton of reasons why, but I think the main reason is, is players just don't like the way they feel, much less the way they sound. There you go. <laughs> that was a weird way to go with that, but very. <laughs> Eric the Red says, shin splints, pansies. Yeah, you know. <laughs> You know, the fun thing about the, the service is, depending on when you were in, uh, it was different times for, you know, different different things, right? So, yes. Um, it's different. <laughs> it's always different. Um, okay. Kenneth is talking about the short one. He's basically saying, like Phil says, the short one, uh, run of wire from the pickup to the pots. Uh, wouldn't even make a difference as far as resistance and capacitance anyway. That That's basically where I'm getting at. You know what I mean? Is is uh, I like to go with this theory that everything ha matters and everything has an effect. And then mentally, I like to assign a percentage of effect to it. So I think I've said this before, but I like this. This is my tone wood debate, or at least it's my tone wood answer to myself. Not to people. This is to myself because I think when the tone wood thing got... Uh, talked about the most besides people just arguing on the internet because that's what people love to do on the internet anyways internally you're sitting there one day going i don't know i think if you're a rational player <laughs> heaven forbid that con that comment if you're a rational player 
whether you thought or didn't think it mattered, you still questioned your own logic of whether it does or doesn't. And so what I decided one day was I was trying to find the answer, not the answer to whether it is, is or does, doesn't exist. The answer to myself internally to where I fe- how I feel about it and what I think about this, you know, is an instrument. And the, so what I basically decided one day was, well, everything matters, and then I'll assign a percentage to it. So let me give you an example. I think a pickup, changing out the pickup on a guitar from a low output to a high output pickup changes the tone. How much so? I don't know. What if I say 20%? Just randomly, I just pick that number out of my butt. <laughs> 20% difference. So if it makes a 20% difference, I would never dare say that changing, you know, a, a, the, the type of wood would have more tonal change than 20%. You see what I'm saying? You could say, and if you follow that argument down, this rabbit hole that I like to follow, at some point you're like, you know, cloth wire versus plastic wire, <laughs> you know, wrap wire. Does it change the tone? Sure, 0.00001%. And the whole point of that is, at some point, maybe you can't even hear it because the percentage is so low. So I just like using that logic. So when you hear me talk, that's why sometimes I'm phrasing things certain ways like, yeah, but no, but yes, or no, but yes. It's because I, I always, always want to kind of stay open-minded to hear a new idea, but also be firm enough in the ideas that I already believe that I can say them with some kind of conviction. It's, it's tough. It's a tough, it's a tough world. You know, this is the greatest time of information I think that anyone can ever live. The amount of information that's out there is great. Problem is there's lots of bad information, but there's lots of good information and you have to go through it and figure it out for yourself. So what else do we got since I'm just went on a tangent? Um, Uh, Tim, Timmy just said, Hey, how much do you think a repaired cracked neck joint would impact the resale of a guitar? How much? I don't know, but it's not a good, it's not good. It's going to damage the resale value of the guitar considerably. So it really comes to really, to be honest with you, that answer is really connected to how valuable and how desirable the instrument is. So let me give you an example. You crack a vintage Les Paul, the repair will considerably damage the value. It could take 30, 40% of the value of the guitar away. That's good. That's almost half. That's a big deal. You damage a thousand dollar, you know, uh, mid price, thousand dollar, not mid price, but a thousand dollar instrument. Uh, yeah, you could definitely cut that price in half having a neck repair. Now you, you take a guitar that really no one's really interested in, right? Cause there's like a thousand of them on reverb used in perfect condition. And it normally sells for 200 bucks. It's worth nothing now because no one's going to take the risk to buy a damaged instrument uh, if you can get the uh, an undamaged one for dirt cheap and readily available. So that's the factor you have to take in. But the sad thing is, no matter what, it does devalue it. And and so you know, this is the thing that I hate. One of the things that I hate is I, I over the years this is probably broken necks are one of the things that you see people fix and hide the most. Um, which is why if you watch vintage collectors, uh, the professional ones, especially on YouTube, you know, where they show you stuff on YouTube, you'll notice they spend a lot of time inspecting the neck. And, um, and that's what I, that's some of the things I don't like about vintage guitars. Vintage guitars is, it's like, um, I have a friend and he, he has since passed away, but he was a vintage guitar dealer and he was uh, very smart. And he said to me once, um, do you know how you know somebody's trying to sell you a 57 Strat and it's real? And I said, I don't, I don't know. And he goes, they want $25 for it. In other words, that was his way of saying they have no idea what the hell they have. And because they don't have what they, know what they have, it's probably a legitimate thing. Right? Now, of course, we're ignoring that it could be a con artist saying they don't know what it is. But he's talking about legitimately a person doesn't know what they have. And... Uh, and you know, that's the thing. So my point to the story is that's the thing. I know this is neck, neck cracks is down a real weird road to vintage stuff, but vintage stuff, that's the thing I don't like about vintage stuff. Whenever you start adding crazy values to things, you are going to, the more money that's involved, the more, um, I want to say un, unscrupulous types of characters are involved in it. And so the vintage market is, is a large market of some scary people. <laughs> So, uh, and so that's why, like I said, so a lot of people always ask me, like, what do you think of vintage guitars? My taste in vintage guitars is most of my friends that are vintage dealers. Uh, 
here's the here's the thing my 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 favorite vintage dealers that are friends that i'm friends with i like them but i can see in their mannerisms and their personalities they're an aggressive personality because if they're not already uh, a, a kind of a little unscrupulous themselves they're so used to doing dealing with those kind of people that they're very hard-edged it's not something i ever want to turn into not something i'm interested in so so there you go. So that's why I'm saying about the the broken necks. Uh, that's why you, it's it's a huge devaluement, but especially in the vintage world, which is why people go to great lengths to hide it. So, um, okay. As I've just alienated all my vintage friends now, <laughs> they'll get over it. They're hard edged. They they could take it. All right. What else do we got? Um, you know what? Somebody, okay, I found another question. Somebody was asking about insuring their guitars. That was another one that I pinned. Um, the question was, do you have to have special insurance for your guitars? For, and so here's the couple things. So I'm not an insurance agent and I'm definitely not in a, a uh, heavily versed in it, you know, to some degree, but I can't speak of what I know, which is one, what I've seen over the years with customers who have had theft and what they've experienced that were negative and positive, And of course, what I personally do myself. So the first thing you have to understand is uh, your two types of insurance that are going to cover you are your homeowner's insurance and your renter's insurance. If you do not own a home and you're a renter you and you have a guitar collection, please get some renter's insurance. The main reason is, is because renter's insurance obviously will protect your collection just like homeowner's insurance. But a lot of times homeowner's insurance what's nice about that is uh, guitars when they get stolen believe it or not the biggest thing that guitars get stolen is from cars and your car insurance isn't going to cover it so sometimes you get homeowner insurance to cover that and again it depends on your policy and what ha what what happens with that but let's just stick to the home keep it easy if you have a guitar collection two things i think you should do this is this is all i'm saying i'm not saying i'm just two things i think you should do because I, I find that it works first document your entire collection Serial numbers, pictures, receipts, dates. It's it's the you know it's the future now. <laughs> so what I'm saying is keep that paperwork, but but more importantly, uh, take those pictures and store it to some kind of cloud device. You know what I mean? So that you have it. That's what's great about those kind of type cloud devices. Take your pictures, your receipts, and your serial numbers and your information in the guitars. Not only for the insurance to to replace them, but you understand. Let me tell you. This is why I want to go on this tirade. Most of the time I saw somebody's guitars get stolen, the, the, the saddest thing was when somebody would walk in the shop and say, oh, yeah, hey, I just want to let you know. And they'd always have some picture like a lost puppy, but it's their guitar. My guitar got stolen. It's a 86 Les Paul. And I'd be like, and I would always, you know, you'd be nice. And you're like, oh, okay, thanks. I'll, you know, hey, if it comes in, I'll let somebody know. But in my head, I'm thinking, dude, you're never getting your guitar back. You cannot just hold a picture of an 86 Les Paul and then tell the cops in the world, hey, if this comes up on Craigslist, it's mine. No, man, you have to have serial numbers. First of all, uh, so we're going to go down a, a dark road. Okay, so first of all, keep in mind that whether you're a pawn shop or you're a small retail uh, establishment, whether you're a guitar store, you have to do something that's called pawn clearance. And pawn clearance in most states, now keep in mind, I'm not versed in every state, every city's law. So if your law is slightly different and you want to just tell me it's not like that, that's fine. You put it in your put your two cents in there too. I can only tell you about the states and laws that I've experienced. So, but seem to be generally, everybody follows some kind of guideline of this. So, because some states and cities don't give a crap as much and they don't make you do it. But in the states and cities that I've, I've had businesses in, what they do is you have, sometimes you have pawn tickets, like a book, right? Sometimes you just fill it out like a sheet and sometimes you, um, you just file it in like electronically. Either way, what happens is when you take in a used piece of gear, you are required now to fingerprint them. But for the longest time, it was just get a copy of their driver's license and you would have to document the instrument's serial number and of course what the instrument is. And then it was sent in and in my state now, I think it's 21 days, it used to be 14. So then you can't sell that instrument. Guitar Center follows this policy. I think theirs is 21. Some, somebody watching this is probably works at Guitar Center could probably put the exact days now, it changes. But anyways, the point is you can't sell the instrument until it has is cleared pawn clearance. Now, why I'm telling you guys documenting your instruments is more important than your puppy dog picture that you think you're going to walk around the neighborhood and find your guitar that way is that the police are only going to do a very quick check and go, 
and look for serial numbers. Serial numbers are how they're going to find your stolen product. And by the way, not to go down another scary road, but once your product is found that it's in a pawn shop or a music store, it's not the sweet victory you're hoping it's going to be where the cops go, hey, we found your guitar, go pick it up. Because then there's another problem. Now, Guitar Center is actually probably one of the best at handling this. So what happens next, if you guys don't know, is let's say a store, your, their serial number that they put in on a, on a product that comes in on for trade or for sale, matches a, a serial number of your instrument. Let's say you're 86 Les Paul. The police notify you, hey, it's at, you know, so so's, so so's music. Ah, Guitar Center. We use Guitar Center. It's at Guitar Center in North Hollywood, right? You go to Guitar Center. Now, Guitar Center is pretty cool about it. They obviously bought that guitar from the person that was either criminal or the unknowing person that was selling it. And this is where it gets a little tricky in nowadays. A lot of times, the person who's selling and trading in the guitar isn't the one who stole it. Now, sometimes they're the friend of someone who stole it, so that's just as bad. But a lot of times, it's because the thief put it somewhere for sale, like Craigslist, for like a buck, right? Hey, uh, 86 Les Paul, first 100 bucks gets it. Somebody runs down, meets that guy in a corner, gives him 100 bucks, and then trades it into Guitar Center for 1,000 bucks, and then it comes up stolen. Now, Guitar Center, and again, things change, because uh, so if their policy is different as of today, but I'm just telling you what it was, Guitar Center would actually give you back your guitar and eat the money. Now, a small business like a pawn shop, what they get to do is say, let's say, that, like I told you, let's say they paid uh, $1,000 for the guitar. They can tell you, hey, you got to pay me the $1,000 I paid for this guitar. Now, uh, keep in mind, this is all, always with the idea that the retailer did not know the product was stolen when they purchased it. And then this is where it gets a little weird. Then if you're like, wait a minute, this is my instrument. You, I'm not paying you for it. It was stolen. Then you go to a judge and a judge decides what happens. And the judge can say, hey, uh, you know, so-and-so music paid a thousand bucks. Give them 500 bucks and you get your guitar back. And you'll both probably be pissed off, but the judge doesn't care. Or the judge can say, hey, give him back his guitar because it looks like you didn't do a whole lot of due diligence to find the person or verify that this was stolen. Or they could say, looks like he did everything right. He fingerprinted the guy. He did this. He put up his full cash. You have to pay him for the value of the instrument. So it gets a little weird. I tell you that story to hopefully kind of like, I'm since I'm in army mood today, it's kind of like when they gassed us in the army to remind us that maybe putting on the mask was important when you got this. Remember this, guys? So, <laughs> hey, let me tell you, I've been out of the army a long, long time. If I saw somebody doing this, I'd put on a mask if I had it. So anyways, my point is, uh, I'm telling you those horrible stories so that you understand. Here's what you want to do. You want to document all your instruments. You want to uh, make sure you have pictures of them. And then once you've documented everything, you want to contact your insurance company, whether it be your renter's insurance or your homeowner's insurance, and let them know that you have a collection of instruments. And sometimes uh, that what they're probably going to do this is what they did in my case was they asked me what was the value i gave them my general assessed value and then they asked for my insurance asked for a real value <laughs> right they asked me to actually they wanted a third party source to value the collection of instruments um and then and then they did that and then they did, they did it and i think if i'm and again i'm doing memory i think they didn't raise my rates or do anything right it was not a, it was not that big of a deal Okay. Keep in mind, guitar collections feel pretty big. Uh, I get it a lot on YouTube. People are like, "Man, all those guitars. This is like uh, this is like some jet skis, <laughs> right?" I have friends that are into hobbies that make collecting guitar look like it's a joke, and no one says anything because they can't see it. Like you can buy a RV, or you can buy twenty guitars. You can buy a Harley Davidson, or you can buy ten guitars. It's like, <laughs> ten guitars is a Harley Davidson like thirty grand now if you get a cruising bike, right? So a touring bike. So you get the idea. Uh, so that's, that's my thing. So all that is on the insurance. So that's what I would do. And of course I would, I'm prefacing all of that with talk to your insurance company because they, they might tell you something that's totally different from what I said. And I would defer to them because that's what they do for a living. I can only tell you the stories and things that have happened to me personally that are worth sharing to you guys. Um, so I hope that helps. <laughs> all right. Let me go back to, uh, some questions. And while I'm reading them, I'll drink some water. Okay, what do we got? We got Matt Wells. Matt Wells says, hey, Phil, I asked last week uh, your input on the weather. 
Oh, no, not on the weather. He didn't even care about the weather. He didn't want to know whether he should give up on finding a tally. Well, I found an Anderson Hollow T Classic. And now... <laughs> and I now know what I've been missing from Telly's best I've ever played so far. See, there you go. You, the best. So what you found out is the best Telly is not even a Telecaster. It's a Anderson T, which is a great guitar, by the way. Right? It's Telly-esque. Right? So, so that's what it is. So, so that's so you know it makes perfect sense to me. Um, part of my problem with um, other guitars, like when people are like, you should get one of these or you should get one of that. One of my problems is I'm really like the Fender neck. I like the way it feels. So a lot of the boutique -y, more expensive instruments that are nice, that are real more, more refined Fender-esque instruments, I love them, but I really feel more comfortable with the Fender neck. So it's just how, how it works. And it's funny because I, I don't know what did that. I don't know when that happened to me because there was a long time where I didn't, I didn't like or know tele, uh, Fenders at all. Um, Grumpy Mike says, how much was the tenor telly? Uh, have a great weekend, and why not? Uh, I think I saw that there were some for a thousand bucks. Obviously, it's not mine. It, uh, Balance sent it, and uh, he asked me, like I said, he's, like I said in the video, he asked me if I would just make sure he was sending it to Dolby DOS, and then he said, "Hey, would you be interested in setting it up for me?" And I said, "Sure." And then he's like, "Hey, if you'd want to do a video, you can do a video on it." And I thought, "Oh, that'd be fun." You know what I mean? Because it's different. I I never played one before. I'd never seen one before. Well, obviously not a tenor telly. I've seen tenor acoustics, but never an electric guitar. So I was curious, you know what I mean? So he sent it. Um, but when I looked them up, if you can find them, which all the ones I found online are in Japan right now, and they, but they're made in Mexico. They just happen to be in physically in Japan, the country, and not like Japanese made. They're just in Japan. They were all asking a thousand bucks plus shipping. So that seemed... That seemed like a lot. Based on what I played on the guitar, I don't know if I would... I mean, I don't know if I would pay $1,000. I think you'd have to really want one. So um, that's why I point out the Eastwood ones. And um, I just, you know, I bet you if you look around, there's others. It seems like a guitar that would be really cool if they made a Squire out of it for $199 or $269. I think it'd be a really cool guitar. I don't know why they don't do it. That's where I think it'd be fun. I think it's a lot of... I think it's an instrument a lot of us would buy on a Lark and see how it goes. But... And I mean, originally they were five ninety nine new, so even at six hundred bucks, it's cool. But it's you know it's different, and it made me think differently, which is fun. But and I had fun doing it. But well, look, so it, I'll say it's one of the blessings of this job, is I got to try something like that. It's the is I get to try weird stuff I would never get to try. So, um, Dylan talks tone again. Hey, Dylan talks tone. He says also I'll. I'll be in your neck of the woods uh, in the motorhome soon. Uh, well, Dylan, I got bad news for you. There is no woods here. This is the desert. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go to your channel. I'll send you a message and give you my phone number so you can call me and text me. We can text if you're in the area. <laughs> uh, it's going to be hot, man. I don't know where you're from, but woo. <laughs> Uh, today, I went to Chick-fil-A. My daughter is learning to drive, and she wanted to go to Chick-fil-A for lunch, so I let her drive, and, you know, she's in the line, and they're outside, you know, because the lines are so long, and the lines, and they have iPads. I sent a picture to all my friends, and the iPads, and it's so hot outside, and the iPads are getting so hot that they put ice packs around the iPads so they don't overheat. So, Dylan, get ready for that, buddy. It'd be nice and, nice and warm for you. Uh, but, yeah, I'll message you out to... Uh, to this afternoon I'll, I'll message you or if you have my uh you have my email address too if you send me your number i'll text you and that way we have each other's numbers so we'll do that so and we'll just social distance as we would um again be safe because we're having a spike in this stuff arizona if you haven't seen the news it's a it's a little it's a little creepy so um brent brent says hey phil my second and third strings sound tinny on my les paul with with my uh, with the tom bridge they aren't fretting out uh sounds like a problem at the bridge thoughts um tinny tinny at the bridge usually when les pauls especially les pauls have a thin kind of tinny sound it's usually because the strings are kissing those frets and they're just not resonating so the the fix for that brent that i would do is this and i you may have heard me say this before and i hope you didn't because you know, because then not get really good advice. <laughs> um, 
the trick I like to do is eliminate some problems. And so the first thing we want to eliminate is whether or not it is the frets, the frets, the frets will starve for lack of a better term, the guitar of all the energy and sound they have. You know what I mean? Uh, it's funny. I've, I've seen this before. You, everybody kind of experiences. I'm going to go on a side tangent, but Brent, trust me, I'm stay focused on your problem. Um, Sometimes I've had problems in the past where a guitar that I love the way it sounds, I didn't like the way it plays, so I adjusted the action to the sweet spot, and now I don't love the way it sounds. And it was just a constant fight. And I, I, I found joy one day when I read this amazing article about um, some, some amazing recording guy, it doesn't matter, <laughs> was saying live he plays his guitars with the action slammed, but in the studio he raises it to get the tone back. And I went, that's ingenious. Now, here's a little thing I've had to do on the channel. This is why I'm telling you this, Brent. This is why it's important. On this channel, I have to, this is what's one of the problems. These are some of the problems about what I do as a YouTube channel now. Um, I like to slam my strings on my frets. You know what I mean? So I slam the action low because I play really light with a pick. I don't really hit very hard and I don't play... I'm not shredding. I'm not low action because I'm shredding. I'm playing low action because, again, it's effortless, right? A little bit of pressure on my fingers. I make a chord. I play. It's great. Um, however, it deadens the sound of the guitar, and it really affects the way the guitar sounds in recordings. So for the videos, especially reviews, I raise the action a little bit. I go a little higher than I normally do. And, um, and that's why, not notice lately, I've been telling you in videos what the action's set at, which isn't really high, but just, you know, whatever it's at, so you can have reference of that. That being said Brent, uh, said, Brent, what I'm telling you is I would raise the action on your guitar to see if the, the tendiness goes away. If it does, you've now eliminated that as the problem. You'll have to figure out your, a workaround for that, right? Which in my experience could be changing the gauge of your strings. That helps a lot too. It's an easy fix, man. So if you have nines or tens, you might go tens or elevens and get the action back down. But that bigger string basically spins um, a smaller di diameter, okay? That's the best way to think about it, right? It's not spinning like a jump rope. It's not spinning as big, so it's not hitting the frets. That's usually a great fix for that. Um, and the reason I say that is usually a bridge, there's two things the bridge is going to really do to affect the tone. First, it could rattle and drive you nuts. That's a factor. And so you're saying tenny and not rattly. So I'm using the word tenny, your word. Tenny to me means bright and thin. Rattly means buzzing and annoying for definition purposes. So I would say in your situation, Tenny, your issue is not the bridge. However, the second thing a bridge can do is it can add a little weird high frequency on that bridge. You can test that. And here's the test that I've done in the past that works really great. I take a piece of paper, just a thin piece of white paper, right? I don't know why. Paper, you know. You've seen paper. <laughs> I feel like I'm. I feel like sometimes I'm like I must be 80 years old. Going paper. Remember that, kids? We used to write on this stuff and give it to our mailman. Anyways, my point is, you could take a small piece of paper, loosen the string, stick the piece of paper in the saddle uh, of the bridge, tighten the string back up to pitch, um, make sure the string is not flapping. You know, right? Because so make sure it's not doing that, and then hit the string. And if the, the tinniness goes away. Well, believe it or not, it could have been the saddle that's causing that issue, and you can go to some Graftech saddles or some other type of saddles that might fix that problem, uh, and, and there's fixes for that too as well. So those are the solutions I would try first. If you, you know, if you brought the guitar to me and those are the quick things. Um, a lot of times when people have issues like that, the first thing I like to do is a bunch of these little, little things I said because they're fast and easy, and if I can nail it fast, it's fast and cheap, right? Um, I like to tell everybody, especially, especially as I've, you know, over the years, it's gotten worse for sure. When I started, when I was a newer, I was like, Hey, I don't care how long I work. You know what I mean? Cause you know, you're younger and you're like, eh, 10 hours on a guitar for 60 bucks. Sounds like a good business model. Now I'm like, no, no, no. My, my time is money. So, so if I can cut my time, I'm cutting your cost. So notice I have a lot of solutions that involve me not spending an hour checking out your instrument because if I charge you for it, that's a lot. And if I don't charge you, it's not fair to me. So I try to find the workaround. There you go. All right, Jeffrey. Jeffrey's next. Jeffrey says, hey, there's an American 57 reissue Strat locally for 550 bucks. I already own a Strat and currently saving for a Les Paul, but how do I pass that up? You can't, man. 550 is the deal. <laughs> so it's locally. Make sure it's not stolen. <laughs> yep. 
Yep. Uh, no, but seriously, um, uh, how could you pass that up? I don't know. Uh, you can do this. My friends do it to me all the time. I do it very little. Okay, so you know, I'd like to point out, and I know my bunch of my buddies are watching right now, and you know it. You've seen me. I do it way less than you guys do. My buddies like to do this crap to me. They like to send that to me. They go, hey, Phil, look at this amazing guitar for a super deal. It's like... And you're like, eh, and then I buy it. So if you can't, if you can't justify where you're buying it, here's what it is, man. You, it's you're seeing an opportunity and you want to seize it. You can seize it vicariously through a friend. So find a friend, <laughs> right? And if you don't have a friend that's in the market for a '57 uh, uh, American Strat for 550 bucks, well, uh, go on your Facebook page, man, and put it out there. Put it on some little forum. Say, hey, local guys, did you see this? I did it last year on my Facebook page. It's probably the first only time I ever did it, but there was this deal local that was so good. I posted on the Facebook page and one of the viewers bought it in a minute. And uh, I think I, I have to be honest. I think I mainly did it not to sh only to share a good deal with people, but I really needed that, uh, that removed from me, that temptation removed. That's probably what you need, Jeff. Just, just remove the temptation, buddy. Send that to somebody else. <laughs> Say, <laughs> tell, tell your other buddies, Hey, look, 57 reissue for 550 bucks. Go get it. <laughs> so, um, so you know, I told you guys, that's how I ended up with the Beast Rich. You guys saw the Beast Rich? That was the Tone King. He he saw that he wanted it, and he already had one in, in red. So he sent me a message, a text goes, hey, white Beast Rich. And I'm like, American made. I was like, what you been looking for? And I'm like, oh, yeah. So it's uh, it's part of the fun. Uh, Chuck in music. Hey, Chuck, I'm going to drink water real quick, buddy, before I answer your question. He says, hey, Phil, I have a Squire PJ bass with flat wound strings. I love the sound of the P pickup, but I don't like the sound of the jazz pickup. Can I put any jazz pickup? Uh, I'm looking at noiseless, or do they have to be a set? No, no, man. You can mix and play with those things all day long. The only thing you need to do is measure that pickup. Very important. Very, very important, Chuck. <laughs> okay. Measure, measure the width of the J pickup. J pickups usually come in a set of two and the bridge is physically wider, longer than the neck pickup. And so if you go out there and try to find a single one, you need to know which one you're getting. And more importantly, on your base, you need to know if they follow the rules. The rule usually is put the wider one in the bridge and then the shorter one in the neck. In your position, well, it's not really neck, but you understand what I'm saying. In the, your PJ base, they might have, I, I'm not saying they did, they might have put the shorter J pickup in there and then put the P's because the P's are so much more narrow. Maybe they wanted more consistency of range. So all you have to do, you can replace it with any jazz pickup you want, but you definitely need to measure it and make sure you're getting the right one. So measure yours and then go online and figure that out. Now, it might get tricky because some of them don't disclose the measurements. It drives you nuts. They might refer to them as just bridge and neck. You just have to, to figure out if yours is a bridge or neck. So take the measurement, go online, look at the measurements. If yours is consistent with the neck or the bridge, you now know you have a neck or bridge pickup, and then that's the replacement you need. And yeah, replace it with anything you want. She takes uh, even the noiseless. If you go uh, Fender noiseless, uh, it's two wires and it's no problem. There might be three, two grounds and a hot. It's always going to be hot and ground or two grounds and a hot. Super easy, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there you go. I, I hope that, hope that, hope that works. Okay. What else do we got? Who else do we, anyone else? Remember question marks first. If you want to ask me a question or talk about a subject. Yeah, X Corgi, X Corgi says depends on if that he's talking about the fifty seven Strat whether it's made in America, Japan, China, Korea, Indonesia. Price widely changed. I agree. He he said American made, so I was gonna tell him uh, same thing, but he said American made, so I'm just assuming he's right. American made fifty seven class, uh, class f American made fifty seven Strat five fifty smoking deal. Made in Mexico fifty seven Strat five fifty. I think that's what they go for, right? <laughs> Ish. You know what I mean? Uh, it's tough. The market is constantly moving. So it, I'm not on it every day, but I generally know. Like I would know that if somebody said they would sell me a 57 made Mexico Strat for 550, it's not sweet enough a deal that I wouldn't look first, right? Right now, I'd, right now I'd go look. 550 on American made 57 Strat, I'm, I would buy it. If somebody walked up to me like, and 
how we just do it. Um, uh, Brent said, thank you for the answer. Yeah, you're welcome, buddy. Okay. Um, uh, Dante says, hey, Phil, greetings from Mexico. I want to replace the X-Style slotted truss rod nut. Okay. So X-Style, uh, he means the, yeah, it's, it looks like a, a, cro a cross. It was originally designed that way for a flathead screwdriver. This is the, the original uh, vintage style truss rods for those type of instruments uh, had an X, uh, but was not for a Phillips head screwdriver. It was actually for a flathead, and you could just stick it in sideways, or I don't know if that's sideways. You know what I mean. Stick it in either, either slot. Uh, so anyways, he wants, to do, he wants to go ahead and replace that uh, with a spoke wheel. Ah, my favorite truss rod. Uh, the spoke wheel is like, a, it's what all guitars should switch to if they can. Um, so, okay. So in his J bass, I uh, wonder if there's something he needs to consider before doing that. Um, so there's, a, there is modifications like I believe Stu Mac makes a, a spoke wheel that fits onto, uh, that setting. And there's, there, there's all kinds out there. So, I mean, like I said, that's something easy to do. It's attaching it, not hard. The problem is you're going to have to do some, uh, light routering. Uh, to do it, you'd have to just take out uh, some some of the meat of the wood, where the neck meets the body. To get to that, you need the clearance for it, so you'd router that out, and then uh, you'd have to cut and router the pick uh, pick guard. So, uh, not in uh, not entirely hard. Interestingly enough, it would be really cool, but I don't think they do. I it would be really cool if Stu Mac had a template for that. You know what I mean? This is a quick little easy template for you for you to do to do a quick router, um, but. Uh, yeah, it's easy to do. Uh, okay, hold on. I'm just reading the question, guys. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> I'm going to drink water while I read. There's so many... So Timothy says, uh, I like this one because it's a non-gear question. And, oh, by the way, I want to say hi to Pedal Pal FX. They're in the house. Um, and, oh, and Pedal Pal, I'll answer your question next, guys. Says, Timothy says, hey, Phil, not feeling like practicing a lot lately. I need to get inspired to pick up my, my bass. Any advice? Um, yes. Uh, I had that problem uh, recently. Uh, and it, it happens differently, right? Um, I think... I think it's normal uh, to be going through, and I'm not saying this is what's happened to you. I'm just telling you, again, I, I like to reflect onto myself, uh, you know, so you guys can, it's easier to pick on myself. Uh, so I would be, I would be remiss or full of crap if I didn't tell you guys that in the last few weeks or months, I haven't been feeling uh, some kind of depression or depress depressed lately. Um, if you guys notice, all of a sudden I have a barrage of videos out, and then I, for a while I wasn't putting any. It's because I was filming them, but I wasn't editing them because I was again I was just drawn down. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's it sucks. One of the things that sucks about YouTube for me right now is not as a content creator, as a viewer, is I click on one stupid video, man. I it's COVID spike in Nebraska, and I'm like, oh, I'll click that, and then of course the algorithm goes nuts, and instead of feeding me cool stuff you know like that I, like a rick beato video that I would watch instead of rick beato i'm getting like now covid's in your coffee and i'm like ah oh, crap not my coffee you know right and so um so basically what i'm saying is is it it, it takes your mind and, and and i have to remind myself i have to recenter that i have to remember that hey the world's a mess that's important but it's important that i stay focused. So, uh, so what happens is you lose a little, I lost a little energy. So I'm telling you how I fixed my rut. So I got into rut different than yours. You're saying you're just not feeling inspired right now. I was actually being, like I said, I felt tired, physically tired from just being sad. So what I did that worked for me was, um, I cheated and I, I kept thinking of things. How do I do this? How do I do this? And what I found was uh, worked out great. So here's what I recommend to you. Uh, Timothy go on YouTube and type in like 50 great bass riffs. The videos, I, that's how I did it for guitar too. It was great. You know, like, tw you know, there's so many guys now that have done great stuff. Of course, there's like Kafir and, uh, and, uh, 
uh, God, I feel bad if I'm not mentioning them. Um, but you know what I'm talking about. There's this great channel. Well, Robert Baker, right? I mean, there's just tons of great channels. Uh, Tyler Larson's done it. Um, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of great players. I'm trying to think of them all, but you get the idea. A lot of great players have done these fun videos where they play like 50 fast riffs or 20 different riffs. And, and what I find is in those videos, those 10, 15 minute videos, put them on and listen. And it is... It happened to me every time. I was like, oh, I forgot how cool that riff was. Or, oh, wow, yeah, that's cool. And then from that, I just Googled the how to play. So, so like, uh, you know, you'd play, ba you know, bass, and you're like, they'll go through, and then they play, like, money. And you're like, oh, yeah, money. And you're like, how to play money on bass, <laughs> right? So that really works, um, especially since a lot of it is, you know, a lot of your inspiration before comes from, came from, you know, you listen to music and you hear a new song or a band you love and they play a riff. And I think what happens to us now is, one, everybody says the same thing. There's no great instrument, you know, musicians anymore. I, I don't think that's a problem. I think part of the downfall of what's going on now with the new market, the new world, is we get so much information that you have to be good at sorting it. See, before, you got four pieces of information and that's all you got and that sucked because you didn't get enough information but now you get four billion pieces of information so now you've got to be so good at sorting information so quick lists like that are great just go just go on like i said youtube best 50 great bass riffs just make up titles <laughs> 10 best you know great bass riffs are yeah you know, and it comes up and it's a, just a little fun and then learn the song you know what i mean works great i did it um I think some of you guys detected it. I, <laughs> in my last videos, I've been playing a lot of the older songs because, again, I was just looking for something to inspire to play because what happened with me was I was making content. Sure, I can talk. I can show the guitar. But then it was time to play, and I was like, like you said, I just wasn't feeling inspired, and that really kills a video if you can't play a, a lick to show somebody what the guitar sounds like. So I started doing that. It worked great for me. Uh, and then I said, Pedal Pal, hey, Pedal Pal, uh, Luis and Alvaro from Pedal Pal FX. You guys know great pedals uh, there in Venezuela. And uh, their new pedal did really well. I, they did so well. I'm so proud of those guys. I want to say that right now. I couldn't be happier. What happened was they were going to send me one to review, and they, you guys, uh, they, they sold out. So they didn't need a review. Um, if they ever need a review, obviously you guys know I'm up for it. But more importantly, I'm just happy for them that, they're 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 getting some success right now and that's great so it says what do you prefer phil pro junior or blues junior and your opinion on the newest version between the uh the the, the three and the the five um i'm a blues junior over the pro junior uh because i like the reverb so the pro junior is an amp that I've probably never given a fair shake to. That would definitely be, a Pro Junior would be an amp that I can tell you that everything I say about it is founded in no fact whatsoever. Not that anything is in a fact, but what I'm saying is like based on my experience. I've played the Blues Junior. I love the Blues Junior. I've owned Blues Junior. The Pro Junior is always something I always saw and like, oh yeah, it's like the Blues Junior, but smaller speaker and no no reverb. <laughs> so, so that's the, the downfall. So, so maybe it's one of those moments where you're like, May, maybe I should really check out a pros junior. Maybe there's something I'm missing there. I don't know. Cause remember, I like my Princeton. It's a 10 inch speaker, but it has beautiful reverb. I like the reverb. So I'm curious. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, Dion to G D Oh, Dian. I get it. D I A N die into the number two gig see i told you guys a lot of your signs like license plates die into gig says robert baker tim pierce rick beato uh justin g yep all good yeah this is great there's so many good ones out there uh and like i said they all they all do that and so you know i should have said this too to timothy for the bass part you don't have to look up bass songs too man you can look up you know 50 great riffs on bass that's there but also you can look up 50 guitar riffs and th those songs will inspire you for the bass parts too a lot of songs uh, have great bass parts, but some guitars have, or some songs have great guitar parts that also translate to bass really well too, as well. Um, so there you go with that. How are we doing on time? We're going to have to call it in a minute, but um, okay, hold on.
<laughs> okay, hold on a second. You guys get sometimes you guys get funny. It's like sometimes I wish I could just sit here and read the banter you guys have between each other. I know a lot of people watch the video each week just to read the banter. Uh, X Corgi says, speaking of COVID, uh, now that the virus is sp uh, spiking again, how much longer do you think live music and cover band musicians are doomed for? Um, you know, I don't know. I can tell you this. Um, so as you guys know, I do repair. That's my main, that's my main, uh, income stream. I stopped doing repair on March 13th. Um, so the problem for me has been, it's, uh, been three months uh, without that income stream. And, and I've realized now I've done a couple. Now I'm going to, I'm just going to be honest with you. I've done a couple repairs for a couple really good customers who we, we worked it out. We did it as safe as possible. Um, and, uh, they brought me the instrument, you know what I mean? And I wiped it down. I did the whole thing. And, um, and what I'm, what I'm noticing is, is that, uh, I'll tell you a concern I have is that not only is that I've been shut down for that, but also, a lot of my customers are local gigging guys and they're not gigging. So it's like that, you know what I mean? So I, I don't know how long this is uh, for, but um, it, it's, it's definitely a time where you have to, they're going to have to come up with something, man. It's like, you got to keep coming up with something. So it's interesting. I don't even know how to put it in perspective, man. So, I just, uh, like I said, right now, I said it before, right now, hope everybody's just safe. That's the first thing. Doesn't feel like it sometimes. Sometimes the other problems seem like they're just as big, if not bigger, but really safety is, your safety and your health is always more the most paramount thing, man. It just, it's hard to keep focus on that. And I'd be lying if I said, well, every day I wake up and I go, oh, as long as I'm healthy and alive, I'm happy. No, because I get, those things really get wear on me too, but, um, uh, so it's tough. You know what I mean? The tough thing for me, and I just want to say this because I know everybody has, this is one of those polarizing subjects about, oh, whether COVID, what this, wear a mask, that. Here's what I can tell you. Uh, I don't really watch the news. So it's not well, like I'm like, oh, no. You know, right? Uh, my reality is I have more, uh, two, two, three months ago when this all happened, I had nobody I knew had COVID. No one. Now I have a half a dozen or dozen friends, close friends and family members that have gotten COVID. So it's, it does have some kind of impact when you're like, okay, well, obviously that's just not the news that that person's sick. I saw him go to the hospital. They're having these issues and they're going through what they're going through is not put, not nice. So it, that freaks you out a little bit. So like I said, so just uh, like I said, be safe. I don't, I don't care what your feelings on it is deep down, just be safe out there. In fact, how about this? I don't care if you believe in COVID or not, just be safe. <laughs> it's not bad advice. It has nothing, one has nothing to do with the other. Be safe, do the best you can for you, for your health and your safety and your family's health and fit safety. Focus on the things that are positive you can. Play some damn guitar because, hey, why not? <laughs> right? What, it's, it's, it's just the thing that should, if you're on this channel watching me talk, trust me, you're, 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 there's no help for you. You're too into guitar. <laughs> you can sit and watch some nerd like me talk about guitar for an hour. You're way into guitar. <laughs> so might as well enjoy the thing you love. Um, all right, let's end on a guitar thing. Uh, let's see. Um, So Aaron says, oh, we're back on COVID again. Says Aaron says, how many of your close friends got flu last year? Uh, well, I got the flu last year. Again, that one doesn't negate the other. Just stay safe. Doesn't You don't have to believe COVID's dangerous. I don't want to get a cold. How about that? <laughs> I don't even want to get the flu. It's just not, it's not something I, I want to do. So I just take my, uh, I just take my safety. Just be safety first. Like I tell my kids, hey, be safe. What, what's the alternative? Uh, Tom, I, I know I saw Tony, you got a super chat. Tom says, I bought an orange rocker 32210 for different sounds. 
in the amp collection, but I love the vintage 30s in my Hughes and Kittner 212. I'm tempted to put the 10 inch version of V30s in my orange. Good idea or bad idea? No, no. You know, the, the, v, the V30s, the 10 inch version of V30s are very similar sounding to the 12 inches. Uh, so, tonally wise, tonally, they're going to sound very similar. They're going to be a little bit more punch, a little more more mid punch, because the, the tens kind of just have a little bit more of a just a little bit more of a, a little mini thump, but they have that thump to them that the twelves don't really have. Twelves have a little bit more warmer uh, low end to it. Again, these are very subtle, but they're there, and the tens will break up a little easier. So there's things to like about each one. But your logic's not flawed. If you're liking the V3012, you might like the, v, the V3010. So there you go. Um, you know what I mean? It depends. It depends. But they're close. They're close enough to where I'd say it's worth it. Okay. And then... Oh, I see. Okay, there's a couple here. Okay, so we'll, we'll do them. I see I'm missing a couple of people's co comments. Okay, so let's do Bill. Bill says, Eastman T386 just bought one after two weeks of research to fix uh, my ES335 gas. Not sure a finer guitar exists for $1,000. Any experience? I really like Eastman. Uh, I think there's nothing wrong with being as open and honest as you can about <laughs> your thoughts. And here's what my thoughts are. Uh, every Eastman I played, I've been thoroughly impressed and happy with. Eastman is a guitar that's been on my radar for years. Funny enough, I have my CG guitar right there, if I'm saying it right, CG guitar, which is a made in China uh, guitar that feels like a Sir guitar to me. I mean, I, I mean, it feels like a Sir. It's creepy how good it is. Um, Eastman is made in China guitars that are expensive, and that's the new thing that everybody's experiencing. And and we have a very interesting world that we live in, in particular in the guitar community, right? Anyone else that probably talk like us would probably sound like crazy people. In other words, like, oh, this is great for made in Japan, and this is an awesome made in Mexico, and this is a fantastic made in the USA, and this is a good German-made guitar, right? The fact that we talk about that. But the reason we talk about that, one, there's some history there, but mostly what we're talking about is cost equation in my mind. So I want to tell you guys, because again, some of you viewers, sometimes I get these emails and they'll say, you guys mentioned that this was made so-and-so. What's the relevance of that? Here's what I'm, I'm going to use the analogy I like. If, so if, my, if one of my buddies said, hey, I just bought a 3,000 square foot house in Indiana, I'd be like, oh, cool, cool. But if I had a friend says, hey, I just bought a 3,000 square foot house in California, I'd be like, whoa, what did that set you back? Both are houses, both are 3,000 square feet, but I'm very aware of the property value differences in different places. And if you don't like the two places I pick because you hate California or Indiana, that's on you. I'm just picking places that I know will make sense. So my point is, <laughs> my point is, is that both are houses, both are the same. They could be the same house, but the perceived value would be the property or where they're located, right? Um, so we uh, understand there's a cost of living differences, okay? So if it costs more to live in California, you should get paid more, right? People know where I live on the West Coast, when we hear about an apartment in New York going for like six to ten thousand dollars a month, we're like, what? But we also know you're probably not making a thirty thousand dollar income if you live in New York City. You could. I don't think most people are though, but if they're living in the city. So my point is, and again, this is all just just for reference. My point is, uh, when we think about a made in China guitar, the first thing we think of is affordable. That's an, th those words are tied together. They're just, they are. Chinese made guitar means affordable to the average person, <laughs> right? This is a, the, for for non-politicized purposes. Um, so Eastman is one of those guitars when I pick up, it's great, but then I think to myself, man, for these prices, you know, could I buy something else? So to answer your question, Bill, I, I agree with you. It's very impressive guitar. It's on my radar. And it's one of those things like I'd like to get my hands on more of them because I really like them. Um, and we'll see. We'll see. Like I said, I don't know. It, it's tough. You know what I mean? Especially having a collection of guitars now because I, I deep down the other thing I worry about is uh, that believe it or not, some of these guitars where they're made is going to help the value in the long term. And we know the, the mass produced guitars and it are not going to have the same value point, but, uh, very cool. I'm glad you're happy. It's like cool guitar. Like I said, everyone I've picked up amazing. I love the idea behind them. So, uh, Gil Lamb says, thanks. I received my KYG 
cap been wearing it since oh that's awesome mine is <laughs> not in the room <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know why i didn't wear it today i could have worn it um so uh yeah that's great in fact <laughs> in fact uh yeah so there's uh there's know your gear hats there is an issue with the hats in the fact that they're not in the store they're only when you see the link down below or something i think we reached out to teespring it's teespring created the hats for us we sent them the logos and do this stuff it, it's like hats are like a teespring's like a a level thing i hope that makes sense to you guys like you hit certain levels of sales and then they go okay now you can sell this and now you can sell that so like at first you can sell shirts but then one day they're like you can have fanny packs i'm not making that up and <laughs> and uh so hats are the new thing uh so yeah i'm glad yeah you got the hat thank you for supporting the channel man that's really cool one thing that's nice is that's the the merch is huge in the way the revenue stream of my channel works is the merch uh we're about to hit a crazy milestone on the shirt sales. Uh, epic, uh, actually. So I'll, I'll announce that soon and we'll do something. Uh, these Know Your Gear shirts, they're literally, I, I, I don't even want to tell you guys yet, but just let's say I, I have a feeling when I tell you the number of Know Your Gear shirts sold since the channel has been in existence, I think uh, I would be shocked if 90% of you don't literally have just a moment of like where you gasp because we've, we've sold an epic amount of know your gear merchandise there's a lot of you out there with that's promoting the channel thank you i'm pretty sure that's where the views come from maybe you guys are just like walking billboards to this stuff i don't know but thank you guys so much for that it's awesome that's uh yeah it's crazy i appreciate it okay tony we're gonna go to tony now so i can get on stay focused tony says what was the best perk of owning a music store <laughs> okay and not necessarily talking about free stuff oh that's interesting well you know the first thing is free stuff in music stores didn't go hand in hand um you know i learned uh, f that's what i thought was going to happen right music store you come in they'd massage you a little bit you know hey i'll give you a free guitar you carry a line of guitars never that way it was never that way um best perk of owning a music store well the thing about a music store you gotta understand i i liked having a music store i opened a music store in 2005 because i wanted to just be around guitar all day uh, I'll never probably get into the depths of why that all happened because it's just, a, it's not, it's probably not relevant. It's not important, but it's, uh, and it's, you know, let's just say the good news is I decided to change things and I opened a music store. So I opened this music store and I just wanted to be around music all day. And that was the main goal of it. And, uh, and, you know, do repair and talk guitars and, and, and do that stuff. And the, the thing about the music store is it's a retail business. A retail business is a turnkey business. Turnkey business means that you are, you're there from, they call it turnkey businesses. You're there, you're, you're there from when the, the key turns. So open to close, you're there uh, every day. And uh, so it's an insane amount of hours. Like I said, it was like 10 hour days minimum, six to days a week minimum. So 60 hours a week was the minimum hours you would work. And, um, and when you're working the shop, you have to work the shop. And then the things that don't get done because you were working the shop, you would do in the mornings and the afternoons. So it's a lot of hours. So the, the thing that was a perk, I would say it was trying all the gear. You know, all the stuff that came in and get to try it. Um, but that's not a, a perk of owning it. You could just work in the shop and get that perk. So owning, I don't know if there was ever a perk if that makes any sense. I have friends that still own music stores and friends that own music stores when I did. And I would have to ask them, maybe they can remind me. I, I feel weird not being able to tell you a perk. Um, I just don't know. The, you know, the the reality of business for, for most businesses, I, I, I'll tell you this little secret. The reality for business, small business in America, and, and it could be anywhere in the world. I'm just saying because I'm I'm in America, so I know that's a national, it's an international audience. And so, but the the thing about business that, that's interesting to people is business is a fight every day to stay alive. If you ever want to, you think business, everybody thinks in business, because especially if you've never owned a business, your success and failure are your two options. That is not the two options of business. That is not. There are many options. And the, the third option is the most common, which is mediocrity. In other words, you don't get rich. You don't go broke and close. You just work all the time to survive, <laughs> right? Um, it becomes uh, it becomes your, your day. And it sounds negative. It's not to be negative. It's to be very 
uh, accurate, <laughs> right? I guess accurate is not the right word. You understand. I'm trying to give you a very measured response, a measured answer. You wake up every day and you're like, I need to make my bills and I will make them today. You know what I mean? So it's every day is survival. You will figure out how to do this. And if you do great and you start killing it, that's great. But then something happens bad. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you the biggest way I can explain it was the the store was open. I opened it in 2005. In 2005, 2006, we did crazy numbers. All right, my store, I never, to this day, I've, I've found very few stores that had done the numbers that we did in the opening of a business. We were killing it. And now looking back, I think it's because, well, you see my YouTube channel. I think people connected with that I'm really into guitars. So you come into my shop and this is how I was in the shop. We talk guitars. And we sold a lot of guitars. In fact, we would sell so many guitars out of our shop that we constantly would have empty walls. We'd sell th we'd sell them faster than we could order them at first. And we didn't know that was not normal, <laughs> right? We thought that was like, oh, that's what you do. You know, we were mad, like, man, all these other stores are way smarter because they order way more guitars than us because they're keeping guitars. We didn't know that it's not normal to flip your entire inventory like in a month and then keep doing that every month, you know, even if you keep ordering more and more. And we did this for a while. So 2005, 2006, then 2007, again, we moved the shop. We went from 1,400 square feet to 3,000 square feet. And I took all the money I made from the first years and we expanded the inventory and we, we did even better. And then 2007, record year. In fact, I, I made an insane amount of money. I remember when we were done, uh, they were like, after, because I paid myself a salary. After you pay yourself your salary, which was very reasonable salary, the lowest I've ever been paid in my life, by the way. Um, we had this dividend. We didn't know what to do with it. And I'll never forget this. For some reason, I don't know why, I decided to reinvest it in the store. Even though the store didn't need it, it was doing so great. It didn't need any money, right? It was paying its bills, paying for everything, money left over, inventory. We took the money and we reinvested in the store. 2008 is the recession. By 2009, that year, I think 2009, I think I want to say, after we didn't pay ourselves, we didn't pay a salary in 2009. I didn't pay myself at all because I remember I used credit cards and everything else to survive. And I think I was in the hole $26,000. So after I didn't pay myself for a year, 60 hours a week for a year of not working, or sorry, 60 hours a week of working for a year, no pay, <laughs> right? I had to loan $26,000 to my business to pay its bills. Now, what's great about that was I didn't have to loan the company the money because we we kept the money from the profits from the year previous, right? Uh, I mean, the year before, the 2007 year. So really what happened was that dividend got exhausted out through some of 2008, all of 2009, 2010. By 2011, the store started making money again and it was back on track again because recession had superseded. Um, so my point is uh, the perks, I don't know if there was perks. I enjoyed it. It was, it was life-changing. It was interesting. Um, again, at that point, you know, I, like I said, I, my main thing though, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave you this with Tony is my main thing is I love repairing the guitars and repairing the guitars was essentially my thing at the shop. That's what I did. Everybody else did all the other stuff. And I would, you know, I would help, you know, sell guitars and I would, I would help take lessons. I would do everything. It's a small business. You do everything. I'd take out the trash, you know, whatever it took to you do. But, uh, I remember always telling myself every day, if I could just do guitar repair, I would just do that. And then when the YouTube thing took off, I remember that's when I, some of you guys, older older viewers that have been with this know, that's when I just made the decision one day. I said, man, wouldn't it be great if I could just repair guitars and and just do this YouTube thing? It'd be fun. And what's funny at that point, I had 12 years of customers that were coming to me for repairs and they didn't care. They were, my, my, my customers that come to me this day, they don't care. They don't care where they meet me for my repairs. They don't care if they come to my house or if they go you know, to the shop. They don't care where they meet me. They just want me to do the work I've been doing for them for years. And so instead of paying insane uh, retail rent and working 60 hours a week, I figured out how to spend some time with my kids. And since I've been doing this, this is like I actually get to know my kids' names. I didn't know what they were. I didn't know their names. I, I got to learn them. So weird conversation, but you asked what was the perk. Uh, so... I don't know. I think the only perk was I got to try a lot of gear. And I got to learn a lot. Tito says, what does Tito say? 
Tito says, Phil, when I saw your tenor telly video, very cool, it made me wonder if you might ever review one of the Fender Fullerton Strat Tele Jazzmaster electric ukuleles. I would love to do that. Um, if you guys see my focus is changed a little bit, I hope you guys have noticed that. So, you know, when I, again, we're talking about the YouTube channel, I, you'll notice a lot of the cha a lot of the videos in the last couple months, especially during COVID, I have been focusing on, I've been, uh, doing products and videos. I think you guys are interested in that. I'm interested in I'm holding my hands here. I'm interested in, you're interested in, we're interested in, instead of trying to figure out how to get companies to work with the channel and send a product so we can talk about it. So I have stuff to make on a video. I just been doing it this way. Uh, this way is where I'm truly more happy when I get to pick what's going on or when, you know, I know you guys are interested in it. Uh, the tenor telly is something that, to be honest with you, Fender would have never sent me because they sold out in a minute. There was no reason to ever uh, advertise them. There would be no ever interest to send it to a YouTube channel like period, but not much less mine. And so when a viewer is like, Hey, want to check one out? I'm like, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do this. And so, uh, I've been working with that lately and it's been working great. So to answer your question, sure. I'd like to do that. Strat Tele Jazzmaster, uh, uh, electric, uh, ukuleles. I'm looking at the new Squire mini Jazzmasters are really cool too. I was thinking about picking one of those up and doing that on the channel too. talk about that. Be really cool. I think you guys are gonna like it. A lot of new videos coming a lot of bit more again, uh, focused in rooted in more and in, into hopefully what you guys will like and what I like to do. Uh, get a calculator and, and fix yours. That's literally this, the, the name of the person. <laughs> get a calculator and fix yours. Says, hey, Phil, I'm looking for a combo amp that would uh, help me get a quacky and high treble strat sound. Is a DSL 40 a good bet? Or do you have another suggestion? Well, the amp's not going to really do that. You know, it's funny. It's one of those things that I've heard people say, like, the guitar is not the sound, the amp's the sound. Well, I don't think so. Because an amp really, it won't get you a quacky, stratty tone. You would need a quacky strat to get that, that tone. The amp can accent that. The amp can, sure, be some part of that. But, uh, like, I can't say, like, oh, no, if you get this Fender amp, it's going to sound more stratty than this amp that sounds more less poly. Uh, so... The, the the thing is the DSL 40, if you have a Strat, the DSL 40 will give you a Strat tone. It will definitely, you will be able to pull out all the beautiful things you love about a Strat. But the main question is you have a Strat, right? Strat meaning Strat style guitar, single coils. The thing about Strats are really cool is we say Strats, we're really talking about single coils. When you hear a Strat, you're really just hearing a single coils. A lot of times you can stick single coils in a lot of stuff and it'll sound very Stratty. That's why coil splitting guitar gives it a very, I feel generic kind of stratty sound. I hate to use that word because I don't want to, you know, say it that way because it seems mean, <laughs> but it's, I'm not trying to be mean. I just think it, yeah, it really gives you the strat tone, but not really, you know, kind of thing. But yeah, uh, DSL 40 is a good mode, a uh, good way to go. If you've got a strat in DSL 40, you can get a Hendrix tone that's killer. Uh, Joe says, hey, Phil, is there a trick to fixing a strategy? Strategy style five-way selector switch. Just want to ask before I replace it. Why do I not know what that is? Let me. Now I got to look this up. Hold on a second, guys. Hold on. Oh, I think you just meant strat. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Yep, Strat style. It's got to be. That's what he's saying. Okay. I understand. Strat. So we're going to say Strat style five-way switch. Is there a trick to fixing it? Or should I... Or or just want to ask before I replace it? No. Fix it. Um, well, generally speaking, the things that wear those out is usually friction. And sometimes they get bent. <laughs> but... Um, I have fixed, believe it or not, this is, you know, anyone's ever been a desperate, desperate situation, situation, I have. I once spent a uh, Friday afternoon because I couldn't get a part. A part did not get delivered on a Friday. And, and I knew if it didn't get delivered on Friday, it wasn't coming till Monday. And I absolutely could not wait any longer to fix this guitar for a customer. So I sat there. I remember spending like two hours with a solder sucker. <laughs> and the solder braid and just literally removing all the solder off this five-way switch and cleaning out each piece and just going in there with my um my needle nose and just bending all the things and i and i yeah i fixed it and i would uh never do that again 
You know how why? I am telling you right now, there is I've never I to, right now I have five five way Fender Strat switches. Right now, I have five four way Tele switches. I have five Super Strat switches. I have five. I and when I say I know I have five, I could have twenty, but I know I have five because I I literally will never go under five ever again. <laughs> so to answer your question is yeah you can fix it. Don't it's not worth it. It's twelve ninety nine. Get a new one. <laughs> Uh, you can see about fixing the issue, but usually it's so fast to swap them out. I mean, I hate to say that. That's that kind of throwaway culture that we kind of hate sometimes. But, you know, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, you know, it would be interesting. I'd love to hear your comments. A lot of times when you guys uh, fight on the Internet, I, I, I don't have an interest in it. This is one of those things, the throwaway culture. I'm a repair guy. I like to repair stuff when I can. But sometimes when I say repair stuff, I'm replacing parts. And that's really like throwing stuff away too. So I don't know. You know what I mean? I mean, I look at it like repairing a guitar is keeping a guitar going. But sometimes throwing the parts away defeats the purpose. But personally, I think throwing away a switch and getting a new one if the other one's defective is not really the worst thing you can do in the world. But I would, I'm would. i open to hearing anyone's opinion about that. If you have a counter argument uh, to that. So yeah, <laughs> somebody says 1299 versus hours of torture is same thing. That's the problem, right? Like I said, I, I, you know, I remember when I did it, I was so proud of myself getting it all fixed and cleaned and, and oops, sorry, and putting it in the guitar. But I remember thinking like, man, what I would have killed just to have the, it was 15 minutes. I can wire up a five-way strat. I think about 15 minutes. So, uh, so So, uh, okay. And then, uh, I'm going to leave on this one just cause I've seen it come up a bunch of times and I don't have an answer, but I know he posted a bunch of times. Um, uh, I will try, well, first of all, Kenneth's asking, or sorry, Mike's asking about the, the, the know your gear hat link. I will try and find it and put it in the uh, description down below right now. I think you have to go, I don't know. I'll, I'll find it. I'll find it. And like I said, I'll post it. I will fix that. Thank you, Mike, for pointing out it's not there. Uh, but the question I was going to talk about was Chris. Chris had posted this question many times. What do you think of the Rev G20? And thanks for all the great content. Keep smiling. Thank you, buddy. Uh, I have not tried the Rev anything. So the G20 and the D20, I haven't tried them at all. So I don't know anything about them. I know... Uh, I, I don't even know which one's which. The D20, I think, was first. I could be wrong. If I, Whatever I'm saying, just swap it. So I thought D20 was first, and then G20, if it's backwards, it's backwards. But I know the first one is just the clean amp that does pedals well. And I know uh, that the second one is the one where it has buttons and it actually can do some of the modeled distortions. Or not modeled, but you know what I mean, distortions and stuff. Haven't tried it. Uh, one of the viewers uh, bought one and loved it. And he was talking about it. I want to say it was Quentin, I thought, that got it and liked it. But if I'm wrong, I'm, I apologize. Uh, I haven't tried one. It's weird. Uh, I so I don't know what to... Couldn't give you any... I don't know. So that's what I think about it. Hear, hear good things. I know they're made in Canada. I know we're back to where that, that conversation is going. Made in Canada, and it's like um, like a 1000 bucks. So maybe it's 1200 bucks. So, all right. Okay. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, and I hope you guys enjoy all the videos that are coming out. Like I said, I have, <laughs> just my little cat out of the bag. I have 60 to 70 videos done. I've been editing them and releasing them. So um, they're all filmed. I'm just editing and releasing. So you're going to notice a lot of content. Um, like I said, there was all these other things that were going on that I just couldn't release content. So you, you're going to get the it's going to be a while before you, we go. There's lots of content. Let's just say that. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm enjoying putting it out. Um, and uh, on that note, I want to appreciate everybody. I want to say thank you. Not appreciate. I want to think, say thank you for everybody hanging out this Friday, as you guys always do. I do want to double check to make sure I didn't miss anything. And I did. I missed. Oh, okay, great. This works out great. Okay. No more super chats, by the way. If anyone super chats now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read them, because uh, I, I gotta, you know, it's time. But Bobby just did a super chat for no reason. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate that for the tip jar. BK says, "Can you tell us something about the great guitar build off?" Sure. I talked about this briefly once before on the show. I'm gonna lose my voice. Hold on. 
Crimson Guitars is doing what's called a great guitar build off. There is a bunch of people involved. Some are channels and some are, I think, just builders. And what it is is you pick a kit. I picked a PRS style guitar. Uh, custom 24 style guitar um, they inlaid my logo into the 12th fret and i think they did that for all the channels or at least most of the channels to do it um, and what happens is we're going to build the guitar and then film it and, and uh basically what happens is i build this kit i put it together i show you guys how i put the kit together it's just a kit build it's not not like a custom guitar or anything and um and uh but you could do that if you want some of them are gonna get, some some builders are gonna get crazy i'm sure and then what's gonna happen is um, we are going to auction the guitars off and the money, hundred percent of the money goes to the charity that we picked. And mine was guitar for, for vets because I've worked with them in the past. And, uh, you know, uh, they, like I said, they're near and dear to my heart. I say that every way, all the time, the same way. Um, but my point is, is, uh, that's what we're going to do. And, um, I'm actually, uh, contemplating, uh, doing something a little weird on mine. I, I try to uh, I try to do stuff that's fun, like I said, fun. Um, and I was wondering what you guys thought about this. And, I, and we weren't going to talk about it today because I was going to bring it up next week. So it's going to be next week's conversation. So I'm going to tease it to set this video into this video for next week. I was thinking about some themes, and I'm going to put out a uh, one of those questionnaires that I put out on YouTube, and you guys get to answer it uh, about some themes for the guitar. So I was thinking about uh, all the different ways I can do this guitar. I can build the guitar to be the, like you know, the best playing guitar it could ever be as a kit. I can just build it as a normal kit. Uh, I came up with this weird idea. What do you guys think? I was thinking about doing a Home Depot build on it. What I mean by that is literally I have to go to Home Depot and get all the supplies at Home Depot and then build the entire guitar only with the Home Depot supplies. <laughs> I mean, not obviously the pickups and the tuning keys, but I'm talking about like the stain and the the glue and the you know uh, fret, uh the tools you know right everything has to be used as a home depot so it'd be like hey this is what i would get I, I don't know if that's interesting um i'm not sure you know what i mean so i don't know just just thoughts let me go, let me let me know your guys thoughts uh, like i said i'll i'll do a survey and then the last one is hey phil any experience with the yamaha p90 pickups uh i'm eyeing a revstar rs 502t thanks bugs I, I'm going to say the last, your name's Bucks. Um, I have, well, you're asking me an experience with the P90 pickups. Uh, yeah, with P Yamaha P90 pickups. I've never, tr well, I've never really took notice to them. I've played the Revstar guitars, really like them. I do. Um, like I said, Yamaha is a, is a, is a brand I like. I've always liked Yamaha stuff. Um, the, uh, and, and like I said, just, uh, I don't know. It's just never worked out working with them on a YouTube level, but maybe it's just, you know, getting their stuff. I, I'd like to check out a Revstar. Um, I like P90s, but I, I can't really test, you know, testify to whether or not those are any good or not. I remember thinking they, they sounded fine. I never remember plugging in the guitar and going, oh, no. <laughs> so to answer your question really unexcitingly, I don't know what to tell you other than they seem fine. Like I didn't have any reaction like, oh, these got to go. Uh, I just remember liking the guitar. So, but I, I did say last week and I'll stick with it that I really like most P90s. I, th I think it said all, last week, I said all P90s. Maybe I should tone that down, but you understand. I, I really like P90s as a whole. And even, even inexpensive ones sound great to me. There's just something about that design of a pickup that lends itself to just, in fact, I, I think it's funny. Most people, when they start learning to do pickups, um, they do uh, single coils obviously right because uh, humbuckers a little tricky to when you're when you're new to winding pickups they get a little trickier cause, but but the single coils use i always think everybody should just make a p90 man it's like my first p90 ever made i was like this sounds great i'm a genius <laughs> and then i realized like it was just hard to make a bad sounding p90 because like, like i said you're just basically putting a crap ton of wire on a magnet and it just it does what it does it's it's, it's okay the hotter it seems the better at some point it gets a little feedbacky and weird but um, and then the, la uh, Shane says last week, super chat missed last week from Tim. Sure. Let's do it. Let's go back. That's, it's great. It's all archived. Tim. Yes. Tim did a super chat last week. He was the last super chat. Uh, he says pickup upgrade for my Sterling Cutlass single coil neck, humbucker bridge, pop poplar body. So poplar is the type of wood and maple neck and fingerboard i play blues rock metal and worship music um you know what's crazy 
is see this is these questions are getting a little tough and here's why they're tough because you're not really telling me what you don't like about the current pickups because i like those pickups right and so hold on a second hold on hold on i want to look because it'll make my life easier i'm looking at the guitar and I'm trying to see if there's any specifications on the pickups and what they did. You know what I mean? If it's something standard. Okay, so pickups. All right, neck Ernie Ball spec single coil. Jeez, thanks a lot, Ernie Ball. Ernie Ball spec humbucker. What does that mean? <laughs> like I said, no, no nothing, no higher output, low output. You know, 8K, nothing, you know, El Nico 5, El Nico 2, ceramic, nothing. Just give us nothing to give us a, uh, an idea of them. Um, but, uh, okay, that's fine. Um, Guitar-wise, you like blues? Um, gosh, this is tough. I, you know what I'm going to do? And since it's the end of the show uh, and, and you did the super chat, I'm just going to throw a random idea out there um, and say... Obviously, I like the uh, the uh, uh, Octave Doctor single coils the most right now. I'm in I'm a little little fanboyish, and I'm in honeymoon mode. Honeymoon mode. I like those. If you got that neck and middle pickup, I think you would kill. I think it would sound great. I think it would make that guitar sound warmer and sound great. Uh, so I would shove that in that guitar. I have not tried his humbuckers. I can't I can't say anything to that. Uh, but I like that Fortitude. I can tell you right now. I I I do have a guitar that I'm working on that I'm putting together. I, I just, I don't want to tell you because it's a video coming. There's a video coming, Sharp My Axe, for me though. Uh, and it's from parts, I'm putting a guitar together and in there I'm using the Fortitude in the bridge and Octave Doctor neck and middle and it's freaking amazing. Go with that. <laughs> That's what, uh, Fortitude is a DiMaggio. I, I'm loving that pickup so much, so much. Those, those pickups are just, I don't know. It's easy for me. I like them. All right. On that note, we're going to go. <laughs> I've been talking for an hour and 40 minutes. All right, guys. I want to say thank you so much for you guys hanging out with me. As always, uh, I, go, I hope you have a great weekend. And until next week, uh, know your gear. And because uh, I'm new back to OBS, I have to hit the button. All right, guys. Have a good day.